My husband and I have lived during 45 years in a farm. My children went to school in a small city nearby named Lincoln. It was a joyful experience. Last year, we moved to Lincoln, which is a city of 30,000 inhabitants. Our lockdown began on March 20, and our city has been closed for more than four months. During the last month and a half, it hasn't been so hard because we haven't had people infected by COVID, and now we are allowed to walk, to ride on bike, and to run. And some sports have been permitted also. But what has happened during this time is that I haven't seen my children or my grandchildren who live in Buenos Aires and cannot travel anywhere. In Buenos Aires, COVID is hitting really hard. For me, it has been a very, very difficult and sad time. I feel lonely and somewhat desperate to be with them once more. We have a new grandchild, Alfonso. We met him at his birth, and since his third month, we haven't been able to see him again. And he is now seven months old. My husband and I are wishing that this time ends soon, and that life will become what it was before. Following the COVID-19 outbreak, California was one of the first states to be ordered to stay at home, so my school was shut down in mid-March. It was heartbreaking that seemingly overnight, virtual school became the new reality. Alone in my room, with no friends, teachers, or coaches to interact with, emotionally, it was difficult to cope. Yet through it all, I maintained the steady hope that the situation was only temporary and would not interfere with the highlight of my year, my summer trip to Tunisia. I could not have been more wrong. Every summer, my family and I would travel to Tunisia, my parents' home country, taking a few days along the way to visit Europe. I would go to the beach, windsurf daily, sit in my grandmother's kitchen, smelling and tasting authentic Tunisian cuisine, and submerging myself in the culture. This summer, however, with the recent surge of coronavirus cases in the U.S., especially in California, chances of going to Tunisia are becoming slimmer every single day. I am now only left with memories of my previous trips to keep me company. However, instead of wallowing in sorrow and dismay, I am determined to stay strong and positive. I am keeping myself busy and productive to alleviate the hardship reading many books, taking virtual summer school classes, and spending time with my family. I'm also focusing on a club I started at my high school, Books for Africa, which is an affiliation of the organization Books for Africa and was sparked by both my love of reading and helping others in need. Although the effects of the pandemic are being felt all over the world, African students are still disproportionately affected by lack of books and academic necessities and their needs cannot be overlooked or forgotten, especially in the light of present circumstances. Although the very nature of this pandemic has been isolating and lonesome, it is vital to remember, no matter who and where in the world we are, we are all in this together. I, as all my colleagues, was forced to be deprived of the university campus 
and to teach our courses online. The outburst of gratitude we received from our students on the online teaching platforms throughout our quarantine cannot be a simple fact. Our students surprised us with the countless thank you messages they posted on the chat platform we used at the university. The situation that was developed was not the same as that of the lecture theater. In these difficult times, a torrent of gratitude overflowed our screens during the distance learning. We missed personal communication. You gave us the opportunity to communicate during the quarantine. You did not let our studies be preserved informal as our life did. You maintained the old normality in our new life were just few of the responses that I received during the courses. It is true that distance learning education platforms and all these things revealed that there are more things we can do to resist, but at the same time, they are also very few. University is not just an image on the screen of a tablet or an iPad. It is the osmosis, the look, the lively negotiation of identities, the ideas that are blended with the noise in the amphitheater, the window, not of the computer, but the window that you must open because of the many wonderful breaths mixed in crowded room. Our students have the right to know that we, their teachers, may need them more, not only this time, but always. We need their voices, we need their interaction, we need the feedback. And this is something that I would like to say to the students face to face when I see them again in the lecture theater. When the pandemic uh, got closer to home, I guess, I was traveling with my son in California. And at that moment, it was really getting used to this a new way of uh, behaving and social distancing, etc. And very quickly turned into we have to go back home quickly because the borders were and the airports were closing. So when we arrived in Montreal, we were all in quarantine as a family. Uh, we used that time to get ourselves uh, prepared, but also to uh, create new ways of uh, interacting as uh, as a family to create moments of enjoyment. So we played a lot of um, hockey in our basement. Uh, we created two teams, parents versus kids, and that was really fun. Uh, and we did many other activities as well. Uh, at the same time, uh, I was following the news in Tunisia and that really worried me. I was thinking about my parents, my friends, loved ones, uh, and how I could help from uh, far away. So I got involved in a number of initiatives there. I uh, was following the, the news on a daily basis, uh, let's see, actually, actually on an hourly basis. Uh, and um, at some point I thought to myself, I need to look after myself. And uh, I had to do something different to keep my mind, uh, you know, uh, change, my, change kind of not think about it that much. So I started working on uh, something I've never done before. I wrote a children's book. And that process was really enjoyable because it got me to reconnect with many friends and really understand something, the whole process there is completely new to me uh, and learn something new. And that's where my mindset completely changed. And uh, the lockdown became, from that moment, something I was very grateful for all that time to reflect, first of all, on what I wanted to do, uh, both personally and professionally. So I set new goals, um, created many changes, I uh, was exercising more often, I started growing food in my garden, uh, worked on new projects uh, as part of my consultancy, developed products instead of services, and reconnected with many friends uh, virtually, but also in our own neighborhood close by, which we didn't do as much before. So the lockdown period was a really a nice little oasis uh, of time for us to kind of reset and rethink to achieve a much more balanced life and to think about what is important.
Before the pandemic hit the country, I was looking forward to do uh, presentations of, of a poetry collection of mine, but because of the pandemic, of course, it was cancelled. Um, in Hanya, where I live, in the countryside, I can take long walks with Darwin, my dog, and uh, news on literature, as well as, depending on the mood, um, on uh, mathematical environmental modeling, uh, because I'm a, uh, an engineering professor emeritus. My wife, who is a uh, biologist by training, and I uh, discuss daily the new cases of COVID-19, and uh, we are wondering when this is going to end. We both belong to the vulnerable group. We also talk about environmental issues and climate change primarily, which is the most important issue. We um, see that most um, international meetings, if not all, have been postponed because of the pandemic, but uh, at the same time we hear about mega fires in Siberia and, uh, and uh, heat waves in the Arctic, and we believe that governments should not uh, find excuses uh, using this pandemic not to do these meetings and not to take action, but unfortunately they do. As the sun sets, Darwin looks at me expectantly. It's the time of our walk and my musings, so I fill out the mandatory form. I write the uh, purpose, the date, and, and the time of my walk, and off we go. I could write a whole book about my experiences before and during after Corona times, but uh, I will try to tell the most important things in short. In the beginning, I experienced Corona in Germany like all others. It was a mixture of insecurity, fear for the future, worries about family, friends, work, and so on. As the song says, at first I was afraid, I was really petrified. Fortunately, my work was not affected, uh, especially the so-called primary suppliers, so food and beverage industry, pharma industry, supermarket chains, continued placing orders and kept us very, very busy. Parallel to my work, I did what I call a quick master in epidemiology, read many reports about viruses and pandemics, watched documentaries including some horror scenarios for the humanity, and consumed a lot, actually too much news. It was a kind of overdose of news. At some point I realized that we are all in the fog. Even so-called experts and scientists are not able to deliver simple and clear answers. Then I asked myself the question, what is the best way to drive in the fog? The answer was quite simple to me. You slow down, keep your distance to the neighboring cars, and of course, concentrate on your own journey. What the others are doing might be interesting, but your own goals are much more important. From that point, I have been identifying new business opportunities, reviving old relationships, and organizing some video calls with my family, my friends, neighbors, and even colleagues. In my view, there is no before and after lockdown. We all have to learn to live with this virus and get used to the risks of further waves, as well as other viruses and pandemics. We simply have to learn to prepare ourselves, including clear plans to become more autonomous and financial reserves for the bad times. This is not just valid for countries or companies, but applies for individuals as well. People have not understood COVID-19 quickly. The main reason, in my view, is because it is an invisible and global threat. It is everywhere and nowhere. Unlike wars, earthquakes and floods, we have not seen bombs, broken buildings or maybe blood flowing. Nevertheless, the fear was always present. When you live in a country, other than your family, as it is the case for me, since my family is based in Tunisia, you always have the feeling that you are too far and can do too little. 
So when you are far away from your clients, you have the feeling that you cannot convince them. But the best driver is and remains hope. We should always turn our fears into a fuel that drive us forward. We should simply be grateful also for the time spent with the virus, also for the virus itself, which made us discover new sides of our personality. Crying and whining is not a good companion. Even if it is hard and maybe sounds stupid, the show must go on. Maybe on a different stage with other partners, actors or directors, we must simply always and without any ifs and buts believe that we will survive, I will survive. We were in total isolation, in the trap, en piège, as my three-year-old son used to call it. In the beginning was the fear. We were scared of contagion, scared for ourselves, but also for others, loved ones especially. We were scared of food shortages and other collateral damages. We were watching TV and listening to the radio and scared of what the world was turning into. Why wouldn't Tunisia be spared this time? After all, we have always been spared all those fantastic things taking place in developed countries. We're used to it by now. So why are we not spared this horror just this once? White masks were hiding extinguished smiles, stifling those who wore them as much as those who watched others wear them and kept wondering, am I doing the right thing by not wearing a mask? Shall I ask my beloved hardworking husband to take a shower before he can hug his child? Shall I keep away from my 70-year-old daddy? Really? Is this really happening? Then I started teaching online classes for the first time, and it was nice. It was vital to hold on to those few hours each week for my mental salvation. Then I started watching my child grow, bit by bit. I could actually see him put on weight while he taught me patience and compassion all over again. I enjoyed spending my day with him without time or work pressures. I enjoyed looking at the expanse of patient love my husband had in store for me during my dark passages. But I could also see my son's confusion at our grown-up fearfulness, at our anger. Kindergarten? Closed. Parks? Closed. The beach? Closed. Why, mommy? Because of the virus, sweetheart. I couldn't say more. Time passed by, slowly at first. Then it hurried up until we reached the end of confinement, of lockdown, if you wish. Tunisia was spared, after all. Not many deaths compared to other countries, and many people were recovering. I was grateful, grateful for my family and friends, for my country and for my health. All that matters is love and health. Not a single material possession could ever replace these two human conditions. On the first Friday of June, the roar of traffic in Athens deafens my ears, attenuated by weeks of uncanny quiet during lockdown. The accordion of time had reawakened its raucous melody, and each morning was once again announced by the loudspeaker of the Romany truck in search of cast-offs. Clean your courtyard of old bodies. Anything you have, we will take. As I crossed the avenue at the Panathenaic Stadium, the luminous presence of a soaring blue sky promised a future that could not, at present, be pondered without trepidation. During the viral slowdown, the church bells halted their clang and the world contracted. I lived a dog's life, going out for longer walks and taking in the smells and sounds of the woods, watching the irises bloom one day, only to wilt the next. The passing moments decelerated and expanded while the days blurred one into another, my mind drugged by the perfume of orange and jasmine blossoms. My electronic screen went from savior to anathema. Certain days were marked by obsession with death. I thought as if for the first time about my father, who was struck by polio at the age of 15 and would not have walked again were it not for an Australian nun, Sister Elizabeth Kenny, who brought her alternative method of physical therapy to a clinic in Michigan. He met my mother a few summers later on a hayride at a lake resort. 
I reasoned that if he had been in a wheelchair, unable to climb into the back of a wagon, I would not exist. That morning I had followed an oddly melodious voice through the pines in Artitos Hill to the overlook above the stadium. I found a Texan tenor, sporting black shorts and tattoos, singing Verdi to a selfie stick. He explained that he had come to Greece to perform Carmen and fell in love with a musicologist. I tell him I am envious of the way Southerners can make a long story out of a short walk to the corner store, and without hesitation he recounts the time his speeding truck flew over a railroad track, landing right in front of a police car. It's a pity I don't have children because I have so many stories to tell. At the spot where we stood, it is possible to imagine the centuries compressed into a single moment, that every past event has led quite specifically to the present, and that essentially everything is happening now. The stadium's pristine geometry reflects the humanistic striving for perfection and the recording of time as if it could be carved in stone. Behind us were remnants of a temple to the goddess of luck, Tike, to whom Greek historian Polybius might have attributed the current pandemic. To the casual observer, they are mere slabs of rock, and I often rest there after playing fetch. Coming home from school on an ostensibly normal Tuesday, I had never imagined that what at first was a 14-day abstention from school would escalate to two and a half months of quarantine. I vividly recall being foolishly happy as my sister and I danced around the house, boasting to our parents how we would endlessly relax for two weeks. However, as the lockdown period started to get prolonged, our feelings of excitement started to slowly fade. As I was selfishly focused on all the things I was missing out on while quarantined at home, I was infuriated. The fact that the imposed travel ban made my family cancel long-expected travel plans was the final straw for me. And then it hit me. I happened to come across a BBC article on how the spouse and children abuse rates have skyrocketed while on isolation, and at that very moment I came to realize how lucky I was. To think that in other parts of the world, people's dream is to have what I took for granted, that is a loving family, was what drew me closer to the realization of my privilege. Personally, I am currently more thankful for what I have, as well as more sensitized on other people's situation, and open when it comes to learning about it. Bearing in mind that the ongoing reality comes as something foreign to the human nature, keeping us confined inside the four walls of a house that doesn't always feel like home. I sincerely hope that we'll get through this the soonest possible. I was living on campus at Harvard University. And in March, uh, the weekend before spring break, we were asked to leave because the school confirmed two cases of COVID-19 within the student population. And so all my friends, all of us, we were asked to leave and if we can, not come back. And so people who had their flights booked for, you know, for vacation and stuff for spring break, they had to cancel everything and just find a way to get to move out. Um, at the time, I chose not to. I wanted, I couldn't, I, something in me just could not move. I have a problem with sudden moving and leaving because of my family's history of leaving Syria suddenly and not going back since. Um, so I decided not to leave. Um, I had my flight booked to DC for the week of spring break to spend it with my family. And, and so I kept everything as is and flew home. Um, during that week of being in DC, the government started like limiting people travel and then we were advised not to travel between state lines and then flights start become very scarce and people were just like at home, like the lockdown literally started but I left everything in my room as is, and I need to go and at least pack my stuff. And I thought if I go back, I can stay there um, till the end of May, but that, it didn't work out. So I flew back at the end of my spring break. Um, I got into campus and it was empty. And it was a sudden, it was very sh shocking seeing how empty the place was when it was a week before the place was full of students, thousands of people literally together all the time. I walked through the yard and I was happy because I love being there, but then slowly and gradually I realized how deserted it felt. It felt like an empty place and there was no one. 
we were able to get food from school, um, pre pre-packed meals. And I walked down the steps and I saw a number of people waiting. Those people were people that I knew and I felt so happy after a few days of not seeing anybody. I saw friends and just seeing them gave me a boost of energy that I did not even knew that I needed. I was falling down so like sadly in like a depressed state of mind but then saw people that I know that I love gave me a lot of energy. So I couldn't stay there for the rest of the semester. I couldn't I couldn't, so I booked a flight back home within a week, and it was an empty flight. I was the only passenger with a bunch of crew members who were flying to DC from Boston. Um, This experience made me realize how fragile our world is and how we cannot take anything for granted. And even if you create some kind of stability and peace after you have to leave your country, this new peace and stability is just not really stable and might be shaken at any minute that's literally what happened and then and thinking that you can be resilient to this sudden change sometimes you're tested and you realize that you're not really resilient because you just can't deal with that kind of sudden change again um that kind of loss because you lost your world it's just like i lost my home country syria i lost being at Harvard and I'm not sure when I will be back I love being there I love being at Harvard it's the best place on earth it's my favorite place on earth and just having to leave suddenly not knowing when I'll be back or when I'll see my friends it's just hurtful and um, but it's also a good experience because as I said it made me realize how we cannot take anything for granted life is short and we have to make the best of it at every minute we have because we don't know if we're going to have another minute together. So, this is it. At the end of February, I was in London for the Troy exhibition at the British Museum. There were people everywhere, on buses, inside the metro, the restaurants, at the museum. No one realized or wanted to believe that the virus was circulating. We were in denial of the potential danger. I returned to Paris, and as I was waiting for the Euro train at the very crowded St. Pancras station, I noticed that many employees were nervous, kept washing their hands. In Paris, It was evident that the pandemic was serious, but officials kept sending contradictory messages, especially about the use of masks. The ugly truth was that there were not enough masks and hand sanitizers, because all these produces came from China and China was in confinement and borders were closed. On my last nights in Paris, I didn't sleep well. I could hear the sirens of ambulances all night long. My last two days in Paris, I went through empty streets, taking photographs of the empty Louvre, clothes shops, bars, restaurants. Paris looked strange, without people and with no noise. I flew back to Canada. The plane was filled with passengers, wearing no mask and some coughing. Roissy airport was gloomy, empty, deserted. During the confinement, I read again the plague by Camus and Thucydides' account of the Athenian flag and found it so well written but too real and depressing. During confinement, I became obsessed with food and I cooked too much, ate too much, and I froze too many leftovers. I miss seeing and hugging family and friends. Before COVID, I used to do several travels each year. I no longer want to travel. I have family in three different countries and it's difficult not to be able to see and hug them. We went from too much of everything to emptiness.
While I have been observing lockdown protocols in the UK, I can't help but think of the ways that Cyprus has had a symbolic state of quarantine imposed on its territory for almost half a century. In fact, these months of July and August mark the 46th anniversary of the partition of the island, and some of my own family became refugees as a consequence of events in 1974. During this lockdown, while saddened to be separated from loved ones, I've tried to concentrate on my research and to use this time to contemplate on what it means to be divided from the freedoms we once enjoyed. For the coronavirus lockdown, however, this is part of a collective effort to combat the spread of the disease, and I'm confident we will see the back of this pathogen in several months' time, certainly in a year, especially if we work together. This is quite unlike the situation in Cyprus, where the sense of lockdown, if that analogy is fair, has remained for decades. I'm also concentrating on teaching, and I'm glad that modern technology allows us to communicate and to learn across vast territorial borders. I'm currently teaching students in multiple continents, and it has been wonderful maintaining these pedagogical practices virtually across the globe. I salute all the invaluable work performed by frontline workers right now, and I hope that if we all support each other during this difficult time, we can arrive at a better future, and one we can start planning towards and looking forward to now. Thank you from Oxford to everyone doing their part across the globe. If I stopped at all, thank you. My experience with COVID-19 and the lockdown was quite adventurous, not only because I got to experience it both in the USA and Greece, but also because I had to travel right in the middle of it. I left Greece in early January to serve as a visiting researcher at Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee. What is more, I actually lectured on early February on the evolving situation of what was then known as 2019-NCOV, the novel coronavirus. On the 8th of March, the first case of COVID-19 was diagnosed in Memphis, and soon thereafter, Rhodes College, like many other institutions, suspended classes for the rest of the semester and moved to remote online learning. The situation deteriorated rapidly. You would walk into a supermarket and most of the times what you would see would just be a series of empty shelves. The situation was much worse in terms of international air travel and in late March, the Consul General of Greece in Atlanta contacted me and suggested that if I was to wait until my planned departure date, which was a month and a half away in May, it would be uncertain how or when I would be able to return to Greece. So literally within just a few hours I packed all of my things and I took the first flight out. As it happens, it was one of the last international flights. During the trip, you would see empty airports and closed stores, but the flights were nearly full with people trying to get home before air travel froze completely. By that time, the situation in Greece was also quite challenging. All incoming travelers, including me, were subjected to a 14-day strict quarantine I could not leave my house for any reason. Actually, someone had to bring food to me. And after that, and for a period of time, everyone outside would have to carry every time a piece of paper with them with a choice of one out of six predetermined reasons allowing them to be outside. I came back to a country where no one was essentially walking in the streets and everyone was uh, in their house. I went through uh, many stages during um, COVID-19 lockdown. Uh, the, in the first stage, I was very worried about my parents, my team, and my business. Um, but as we follow the Italian uh, news, uh, which is really nearby, we were very worried about the medical personnel. 
Um, so I closed my business, I asked my team to stay home uh, and locked myself with my parents. Um, the second stage, um, I became very um, active um, f in the virtual world from my bedroom. Um, so went on fundraising for our regional hospital, collaborated with the Red Crescent um, to feed all those that lost their jobs, started doing business online with the local uh, startups selling things online that I never paid attention to. Um, and in my free time, I attended so many webinars on topics I knew nothing about. Um, the third stage uh, was when the lockdown started to uh, get lifted. Uh, I was fin finally back in my business with my team, and I realized that what was most important was staying together, having empathy for one another and with the planet, and believing in, in a better tomorrow. Um, today, the business is very slow. Um, it's not as usual, but uh, it's a little bit scary because I have a lot of salaries, but at the same time, it's exciting because I feel I have a startup where I have to innovate, innovate to survive and create new opportunities. I believe my earliest memory concerning the subject was an incredible increase in dogmatic superstitions, while earlier the scandal of the imprisonment and torture of the Uyghur ethnic group, a Muslim minority in China, became trendy in Tunisian social media. Almost everyone around me was talking about how this is a form of divine punishment by God meant to target the Chinese population for taking part in the quote-unquote suffering of Muslims. I remember being outraged by the amount of ignorance that came to light following the spread of the pandemic. I jumped to my computer and wrote a few Facebook posts uh, criticizing all this hate and bitterness engulfing my community under the pretext of supporting our quote-unquote Muslim brethren. I noticed through people's reactions to my posts that many agreed and condemned this type of behavior and this mentality. However, as is the case with the majority of this world's population, the common man drowns in such ignorance and unnecessary hostility. Moving forward to the period between February and March, a collective state of panic spread among Tunisians faster than a plague, especially after things escalated in Italy first and the rest of Europe and the US. We all expected the worst case scenario, Tunisians as a people don't exactly have the slightest trust in the institutions of our government and especially public healthcare institutions. We constantly live with stories of people suffering to death while waiting for someone to have mercy on them and examine them in a public hospital, or stories of fatal mistakes done by hospital staff and so on and so forth. Whether such stories are true or made up doesn't matter because by the end of the day they achieve their purpose of spreading fear and mistrust among Tunisians. Add to that the daily scenes of people crumbling on each other like bees desperate for some extra food to store and the circus show that is our political scene in parliament and you get enough reasons to justify a panic attack almost on a daily basis. But in spite of all of this, we were somehow protected by some luck or divine power, whatever you choose to call it, and the situation didn't get as bad as we expected. I spent the whole lockdown due to COVID home alone. It wasn't hard for me at the beginning because I live alone for many years, so it wasn't something new for me. I managed to organize my obligation as much as I could, to stay at home as much as possible. For example, I went to the grocery store to buy the essentials once a week. In general, my everyday life was not so much affected, except from the fact that I couldn't go to work and to the university, of course, to attend the courses. What I mean is that my routine generally was about me spending many hours studying or planning lessons for my job, something that occurred before lockdown as well. So I didn't feel much pressure on staying at home many days in a row. For me, so lockdown was great, to be honest. 
I had so much time to spend reading, studying, and getting prepared for some mid-year exams that I had. I also had online classes and lots of assignments to do. I worked out more and I took more care of my nutrition and in general I just could do more things for myself, uh, things that please me. Of course I was calling my parents and friends all the time. Uh, during the Easter break I felt kind of lonely, I had to pass the Easter uh, break alone so that was a little hard for me i missed my parents my boyfriend my friends uh, fortunately i spent easter day with my neighbor so that made me feel a little better but uh, the worst period for me was after the lockdown for many reasons one of which was that i found myself unemployed And that was when the hard situation actually started for me. I've always thought of myself as a strong person, the good man in the storm kind of person. I didn't think that the global pandemic would affect me. I felt that I was immune to the chaos, to this panic over food, hand sanitizers, masks, toilet papers, and here in Tunisia, it was over packets of flour and sugar. I thought it was crazy. Why making a fuss? It will be over soon. The confinement started to be longer, and only then did I realize that it was serious. Then I tried to reassure myself by constantly repeating, it can't happen to us. You know, the same defense mechanism to overcome fear of losing someone. It only happens to others, not us. I kept chilling, reading books, binge watching silly YouTube videos and TV shows. So at first I said it can't be us and then it can't be me. I was young, I was healthy and it just can't be me. I have plans, I have dreams and what about my to-do list before heading 30? Panic was rising within me, causing an incontrollable wave of thoughts. I define myself as a practicing Muslim. I believe in God, and I believe that death is not the final destination. So basically, I was not scared of death, but rather, I was terrified of the idea of time, that I wouldn't have a time to do the things that I wanted and say the things that I wanted to say, because I thought that I still have time. Time is such an unappreciated thing when we're young, because we spend time celebrating our youth and saying no to many wonderful things that life can offer. It's too early, I passed my turn. Like in movies or in books, when the protagonist makes his realization that what matters is now and now is the time to make a change, so get up and live your life. Well, during the pandemic, things are not that easy. Even if you have the budget for it, you're stuck at home. And spoken words and unshown feelings were expressed through social media. In normal days, I will be the one who says, I avoid social media as much as possible. But during the pandemic, I kept in touch with everyone I know. Literally everyone I know. Former classmates from primary school, middle school, high school, and uni. I messaged everyone and made sure everyone was okay. It was kind of catching up and romancing funny anecdotes and emotional stories. I spent time with my parents too, and I enjoyed being with every single person through physical and virtual presence. We discussed a lot of stuff, and we disagreed a lot, but I didn't care. Hearing their voices, their laughs, and seeing them get angry about current events, sometimes crying, made it feel like it was a normal conversation, going under normal circumstances, and I forgot it was unsafe outside. I needed this violent realization to be more present with people that I love and care about, and also to live the present moment and not plan years ahead without taking the time to enjoy what I have now and be spontaneous about my feelings and thoughts. It is early June and I finally returned to Kavala, the field base of my comparative project about environmental protests in southern Italy and Greece. As a way to celebrate my return, I go to the taverna where I met Angelos, a chatty waiter. In February, we had commented the outbreak of the pandemic in Italy and exchanged life stories and views. The day Angelos is wearing his mask and gloves, I greet him and ask how he is. I'm wearing a hat which partially covers my face and he does not seem to recognize me. As soon as he does, however, he welcomes me by literally hugging me. I'm taken by surprise and I only mumble COVID or coronavirus as he disentangles me from his embrace 
His eyes smile and he says, come on, we don't have it. He then expresses me his fears about the impact of COVID-19 on local tourism, stressing how heavily Greek economy in general relies on tourism. This interestingly and paradoxically soon translates into questioning the morality of the guest, who by traveling exposes the host to the risk of contracting the virus, as it were. Angelos indeed refers to the recent cases registered in Samsi, only 50 kilometers from Kavala. Now tell me, if the Greek health system could not handle the pandemic for Greeks, how is it going to treat tourists if they get ill here? Look, if the lockdown had a meaning, what's ahead of us is strange. Aftopumas perimeni in a But we will behave as usual. We will welcome anyone as usual. We are hospital people. Allah all afto in a paradoxo. This is absurd. We see how Angelos evokes here the notion of philoxenia, a core value of the national portrayal, and he uses the adjective paraxeno, the unknown and unfamiliar, and paradoxo, what is against the common way of thinking. Indeed, in the times of COVID-19, and in its summer phase in particular, hospitality seems to challenge the doxa. Hospitality, however, has always been a slippery concept, endued with indebtedness and morality, and its slippery nature is further exacerbated by the collapse of the taking-for-granted distinction between who is the guest and who is the host. The guest, the stranger and potential threat, this time really is the virus, the invisible enemy. The guest, the tourist, is however a potential host of the virus, which is itself a non-human and a non-welcome guest. This is ultimately the paradox of the host through which the ethics of hospitality, which, with its rules and roles, is destabilized, even subverted. At 72, I was, I was returning to University College Dublin to start a degree in classics. There was a lot of autonomous reading. It was possible for my wife and I to maintain life's rhythm. With our children and our grandchildren living in the US, in Chicago and New York, we traveled there three or four times a year, and they spent summer with us in Ireland, mainly in Kerry on the wild Atlantic coast, the most westerly tip of Europe. Then came the virus, and life's rhythm changed. In early March, the Irish government locked down the country and ordered us, the more vulnerable, to cocoon within our homes. We put green flags in our windows on St. Patrick's Day, and instead of walking Dublin like that other Odysseus, Leopold Bloom, we spent Bloomsday, June 16th, my birthday, following virtual events, blowing out candles on Zoom with our grandchildren in Chicago. With travel suspended to and from the US, the numbing reality of exile has hit us. Exile that feared fate and the tragedies is imprinted on the Irish psyche. The older generation remembers the American wakes, which were held when children left for the US, parents then knowing that they would never see them again. Of course, we now have modern communications, but the Zoom images are followed by silence and the unspoken question, when will we meet them again? At such times as WB8 said, I am old and terrified and tight. To shield ourselves from this cold reality, we structure the day, my wife gardening, baking, and learning to play the piano, while I continue to read. Fortunately, I came across the CHS site, where the brilliant Wednesday evening productions have become an invaluable support. In late June, with the travel restrictions within the country lifted, we traveled to Kerry, where we are fortunate to have inherited an old thatched house, from which in the past, many had emigrated. In a normal summer, it's filled with the swallow laughter of our returned Yanks. Now its stone walls speak of memory and silence, and as the American poet Philip Levine said, the fields whisper their courage. Like the watchman, I stand on the shore, looking out at the Atlantic, and long for them to come home. We can only wait, as Seamus Heaney said, for hope and history to rhyme again. <laughs> 